congressional gridlock on key issues like immigration and taxes are being affected by the 2024 presidential race. For all of this and more, we turn to the analysis tonight of Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post. Good to see you both, as always. So I want to start with your reaction to the U.S. tonight starting a series of military strikes against Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. This response, we should say, is expected to be just the beginning of, uh, of a longer response. David, you first. I think it was proportionate. You know, uh, we've got to do, I think, be strong and show resolve, uh, establish deterrence, establish defense, freedom of the seas, but you don't want to sow chaos. And so I think what the administration done is hit the Iranian-backed militias without hitting Iran itself, which uh, Lindsey Graham and a lot of other Republicans, I'm sure, will say we should have hit Iran. I've become a little suspicious of the idea that in the Middle East, you should go out to solve your problem to f seek some p permanent solution. And that's what Israel's trying to do with Hamas. Maybe they're right to do it. I think they need to defeat Hamas. But the idea that we can somehow defang Iran all at once, uh, that, that to me would probably not work. And so this is a proportional response. Jonathan, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I agree with David. But I also would uh, add that the timing of this, at least the announcement of the strikes happening, is um, interesting. Because today we had, <clears throat> excuse me, today we had the dignified uh, transfer of the bodies of the, the three American service members who were killed. You had the Secretary of Defense there on the tarmac for this very solemn ceremony. You had the President and the First Lady there at Dover, Dover Air Force Base for this solemn ceremony. Carried, I think it was carried live on television, but it was carried in full when the video came in. The entire nation got to see this. And then the world found out that the United States responded. I think that, that that sort of timing, plus the use of B-1 bombers in this operation, sends a very clear signal to the region, but also to Iran, that the United States isn't messing around. And President Biden and his top aides had been clear they don't want a proxy war with Iran to become a more significant conflict. They don't want to draw the U.S. into a wider war in an already unstable region. How do they head off that possibility when it appears to be inching closer? Uh, with Goldilocks, yeah, just right. And Iran, to be fair, has sent some messages that we don't want a war right now either. That doesn't mean they won't want it someday. And so the historian Hal Brands had a good essay in Foreign Affairs over the last week or two, which said, go back to the 1930s. There were three regional conflicts. Japan was sweeping through China. Germany was obviously establishing fascist rule in Central Europe or in Western Europe, and then Italy was trying to establish a fascist empire in Africa. And what happened over the next few years was those three separate regional conflicts coalesced into one big conflict, which we called World War II. And so what we need to prevent is that Iran, China, and Russia will not coalesce into one anti-liberal, completely violent uh, moment. And that's why I think this moment is so fraught. And I think it's why the Biden administration has tried to be strong but tempered in the middle of it, not to spark that kind of coalescence. Mm. But also keep in mind that the strikes that, are, that have happened tonight, uh, tonight, our time, apparently is the, the beginning of a campaign uh, that the administration has been signaling for a while, that this could be an ongoing campaign that could last weeks, if not longer. Yeah, as one official put it, this is the beginning of the beginning. Let's shift our focus to domestic matters, namely the South Carolina primary tomorrow, the first primary on the Democratic nominating calendar. Uh, you might have seen that interview with Congressman Clyburn earlier. President Biden is expected to win South Carolina, obviously. <clears throat> but in what way is this a test of his support and enthusiasm, David, moving forward? Yeah, well, you know, in Joe Biden won among young black adults uh, in 2020, 89%. Now he's down to 60% with, the, with young black adults. So that's a significant loss. That's a lot of people you're losing. So he's got to somehow reestablish that. And I was very struck in your interview with how James Clyburn emphasized the student debt issue. And I think that really did turn a lot of the people. I think Gaza has turned a lot of young black voters. So he, they've got to win them back. Uh, and I, I think Clyburn put it well, which is that you ask somebody nine months before an election who they're going to vote for, they're not thinking about who they're going to vote for. They're thinking, how do I send a message? And so I think a lot of people want to send a message. When they're actually in the voting booth and Donald Trump and Joe Biden are here, it's going to be a very different decision-making process. So we shouldn't confuse polls today from an actual election. Do Democrats see it that way? I mean, because they've complained for years <clears> now <throat> as what they see about, uh, you know, this, this disconnect between popular policies, as they say, popular Biden policies, and the fact that President Biden isn't getting credit for them. 
Uh, look, if there's anything that viewers should know and understand, if they don't know this already, to David's point about once people get into the voting booth and they have the choice between President Biden and Donald Trump, African American voters are pragmatic voters, probably the most pragmatic voters in the American electorate. Um, we're used to not getting everything that we want uh, all the time, and yet when when we go into the voting booth and have to click the lever and vote for someone who we think is going to best protect our families and our interests, that's when the pragmatism kicks in. Um, I can understand people being upset about student loan relief, what's happening in Gaza, voting rights, criminal justice reform. But when you're faced with an existential threat like Donald Trump and the, the damage he could do if he gets another term, Joe Biden looks even better than he does now. Let's talk about a couple of the uh, legislative priorities that are uh, being affected by this campaign, namely the, the tax plan. The House voted on Wednesday evening to pass a $78 billion bipartisan tax package that would temporarily expand the child tax credit and restore a number of uh, business taxes, um, business, or rather tax credits for businesses. And the vote was 357 to 70. You'd be hard pressed to find 357 <laughs> members of Congress who agree on what day it is, and yet you had 357 members of Congress agree to move forward with this bill, and yet it might not go anywhere in the Senate, at least not anytime soon. Yeah, you know, I understand why you don't want to pass something that might help your opposing, opponent in the fall of an election year. But this is what well, we're in the beginning of February. So if the entire year we're not going to pass anything because we might want to help somebody, uh, that seems awfully cynical, especially at a point when one of the issues is the child tax credit, which is a which when it was briefly expanded under Biden early in the administration, lifted three million children out of poverty. That's reality. Uh, and then we may get to it, but the, the other thing that's sitting there is the, what I think of as the global chaos bill, where we're helping Iran, I mean, well, we're helping Ukraine, we're helping uh, Israel defeat Hamas, and we're securing the southern border. And if we're going to uh, tolerate global chaos for another few years because we don't want to help our opponent or ourselves, that's just the obscene politicization of the legislative process. Well, that seems to be the dynamic with the immigration bill and even with the yeah. tax bill. Senator Chuck Grassley, according to Politico, said the quiet part out loud that he didn't think it was in Republicans' interests to move forward with this bill that could be a win for President Biden in an election year. It, what it shows is both between the tax bill and the immigration bill, the tax bill coming out of the, roaring out of the House and being blocked in the Senate by Senator Grassley, the immigration bill in the Senate that no one has seen yet, and and yet you've got the Speaker of the House and Donald Trump trying to kill it before it gets out. The, Congress is broken. Congress is broken. The House is broken. The Senate is broken. And really what we're seeing, to pick up on David's point, it is sort of the, the what's the word, metastatization of what happened when um, Justice Scalia died. President Obama nominates Merrick Garland to be the Supreme Court, just, the Supreme Court nominee and Senator Mitch McConnell, I think it was uh, majority, leader at, at, majority Leader at the time, says, nah, and it was February, no thanks. We, we should wait for the presidential election. Look where we are now, where, where legislation can't even get out of either chamber because it would give a win to the president, never mind the Amer real American people who would be helped by both pieces of legislation getting out and getting to the president's desk for a signature. Before we wrap up, I want to bring up uh, the focus of Laura Barone Lopez's report tonight about Taylor Swift being targeted by right-wing talking heads, suggesting that she's part of this conspiracy to help President Biden get reelected. What is the political utility of targeting the most popular <laughs> entertainment figure in the world? Why would Republicans even engage in that enterprise, David? Yeah, that when, uh, you know, when Ronald Reagan was president, the, the Republican Party had three purposes, defeat communism, defend free market capitalism, and celebrate an America where a wholesome pop star fell in love with an attractive football player. Like, this is as Americana as you can imagine. And yet what's happened under Trump is abnormality, <laughs> like a, a detachment from normal American life into conspiracy mongering. And then what's also happened is you have this entertainment complex of hucksters and showmen who want to generate buzz. And what's a better way to generate buzz than attack the NFL and, and Taylor Swift? David? I'm sorry, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the types of conspiracy theories that are being thrown around 
would make Carrie Matheson go, oh, come on. I mean, this, this is insane. I, I can't help but, but laugh to the point of crying, but then crying because this is what's happened to one of the two major political parties in this country where you have a guy who ran for, pro, who ran for the Republican nomination saying that this is all part of a plot for the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl so that she could come out on the field and nominate and, and, and endorse the president with people. Just pass the immigration bill. <laughs> Pass the tax, pass the tax bill, and let's have a real conversation instead of doing this hucksterism and nonsense that's happening on the right. And not for nothing, David Brooks, I hear you're a bit of a Taylor Swift fan. I like early Taylor oh, better than late Taylor. Yeah, now I, sometimes favorite, favorite song and favorite lyric. Well, sometimes she just touches me. She speaks for me, like you know, she wears short skirts, I wear t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> She's your captain, I'm on the bleachers, dreaming of a time when you wake up and find that what you're waiting for has been here the whole time and story of my life. But I will say my favorite lyric, is, I'm getting carried away here. No, something, please, something continue. I really, continue. Something I really know I feel about. like I know you on better. Her, her last album, uh, she's got a lyric, my covert narcissism disguised as altruism like some kind of congressman. That is a great lyric. It shows she's been talking to Lisa Desjardins, Desjardins or something. She knows how congressmen, how their narcissism displays itself. So I will vote for anybody Taylor tells me to. So. Jonathan, do you have a favorite lyric? Or, I do not. Or? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm more of a Beyonce guy. All right. Well, on that note, Jonathan Capehart and David Books. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good weekend. <laughs>